But I remember a very amazing story where we went to London uh, to try to get on board because we needed money, try to get on board Sotheby's, try to get on board Christie's. And in 1989, the, the Bosch company said, Internet, never, never. Presented by Arcata, the anti-fraud and customer due diligence network for the art world, The Bigger Picture presents a special series of episodes in partnership with London Art Week. A showcase of the best the art market has to offer, we take an inside look at the galleries participating and the stories behind the people that shape them. With an illustrious history, founded in 1923 and now in its third generation, Didier Aron exhibits at TIFAF, Fine Arts Paris, Frise and the Salon de Dessin and participates in London Art Week. Focusing on French art from the 16th to 19th centuries, the gallery has placed works in institutions such as the National Gallery, the Met and numerous principal museums of France. Twenty years ago the gallery would go on to negotiate the sale of one of the most important old masterworks by Titian to the Getty Museum for more than $50 million. With galleries in New York, London and Paris, today the business is overseen by Didier's son and President Hervé, who has been continuing the family legacy. Despite your family ties, you didn't envisage dealing in art. In fact, you wanted to open an advertising company. So what was the attraction? The attraction is that uh, I've always been interested in communication, even after that. And at the time, I did a Master of Management with uh, two friends, and we wanted to open an advertising company. That's all. So how did your father react to your apparent interest in advertising? Uh, my father did the same thing with my brother, which is just something really amazing, which is that he told us at the age of 18, you're going to do serious uh, studies and you're going to do art history study. And at the end of all that, you're going to decide if you want to work with me or not. Except that on one side, being uh, having a master of management, uh, he says he was saying uh, goodbye and good luck in life. Where on the <laughs> other side... If uh, we were working with him, I mean, um, we were going to have a salary, we were going to have a house, etc., etc. So as my brother and I loved also that business, I mean, the choice was rather evident. Mm -hmm. I mean, your father, Didier, was a unique man who clearly lived a very full and eventful life. An intellectual and an academic with degrees in art and law, as you've already referenced. Before opening his boutique, he had actually fought in the French resistance at 18 um, and was awarded the Legion of Honor, the Croix de Guerre and the Medal of Resistance. How do you think his experience in war influenced his attitude to life? It changed him uh, totally. I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious. I mean, he was before the war, probably the best uh, student in his school, in his lycée. And uh, there would not have been the war uh, where they lost absolutely everything. Uh, he would have uh, had probably a career in uh, in business and not in art. And uh, it was also, I mean, the fact that uh, um, his mother, my grandmother, was uh, dealing in uh, in uh, in antiques and uh, opened a company which was called uh, Sin France. She was in uh, she was importing Chinese objects to France between the two wars. But it was a hobby because my grandfather was the um, the head of the uh, um, the trading uh, uh, group at the at the French Bourse, and so basically, I mean, one the war made him go because he was uh, he, they were totally broke broke, and uh, uh, once it made him work to something where he could get money immediately. So that was the uh, being an antique dealer. And uh, how it did influence uh, the rest of his life was that it also changed his personality. I think my father, before the war, when he was very young, uh, was a total romantic person. And after the war, I mean, living through what he had lived through, uh, it, uh, it built around himself a kind of shield. And he became a rather... Um, out, on the outside, at least, a rather strong and tough person. It was. It's interesting, though, that he was uh, when you were eighteen, and you and your brother were given the opportunity to make a decision under your own steam. That you did actually 
pursue a career in, in and you join the family business. Now, understandably, of course, you cite your father as, as having been influential. Um, what remain some of the most important lessons in life and business that you, that you, you taught yourself and your brother? I mean, the, 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 the lessons in life are, uh, are, are a lot of them, but I mean, I, don't, I cannot recap them very well like this. But uh, what I think that uh, uh, what I remember the most uh, and what I'm the most grateful about the principle, except about the principle that my mother and him uh, gave us, what I'm really grateful to him about is that he did teach us how to be curious and how to look. And uh, I mean, since that, I mean, I was pro I had probably a good uh, um, nature, which is that I look very, I have, don't have a good memory, but I look very, very fast and uh, have a very fast eye. And my father did teach us uh, really to be curious. And that's, uh, I mean, th that's a great thing. That's really interesting, actually. This is, um... Not surprising, it's come up in previous conversations, this notion of curiosity, the importance of curiosity in youth and throughout life, and also um, the development of your eye over time. So it's really interesting to hear that your father had, 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 had seen the importance of that. Um, now, you both, of course, you both share degrees in art history and where your father studied law, you actually studied business in Paris. And you've already referenced this. I'd be curious to know, how did your business qualifications change your view of how the gallery was run, introducing that as a series of qualifications into the running of a gallery? That's uh, probably one of the most amusing questions that you did put. Uh, uh, and, uh, and my answer is going to be very surprising, uh, except uh, maybe uh, learning how to read the balance sheet, uh, which I did in my accounting uh, course in, uh, in my Master of Management. I don't think that my business qualification or the business qualification of my father being a, the, a law degree had anything to do uh, and did not bring much to our, uh, the way the gallery was run and to our experience. Yeah. I mean, you, your father actually was also one of the first to see the connection between dealing and interior decorators. And I think this is actually tied and links in nicely with you having referenced curiosity. And in the 1960s, he partnered with Alain de Maché and is credited with having started the career of Parisian decorator Jacques Grange. Um, Alan Souls, director of your New York gallery, had said of your father, he was always interested in trying new things. Curiosity again. Um, do you think your father was an innovator? How, and how important do you think innovation is in business? Uh, innovation is very important in business, uh, at least to have an open eye and an open mind. Uh, what did my br father bring uh, was two things. First of all, he was uh, uh, a dealer of 18th century French furniture, but at the same time, he was buying uh, Japanese art, uh, lacquer, he was buying um, a policy ware. Uh, I mean, he was buying a lot of different type of things. But the most important, as you uh, are asking me this question, the more important thing I think is the fact that uh, working with Alain de Machy, uh, they were the first one uh, doing um, houses like the House of Edmond Rothschild or people like this. I mean, they were the first one to introduce uh, contemporary furniture in their classical settings. And uh, there is, for example, an example which is the, uh, uh, the, the most, uh, the piece that he used the most and in which he adored was uh, an armchair, I think, which was created in the 1950s by Charles Eames. Uh, and uh, he used to use that with uh, with this, the 18th century furniture that he was selling to his clients. So uh, his innovation uh, in his business was the innovation of mixing modern and uh, antiques probably before, a long time before anybody else. Yeah, that's so interesting. Of course, you're referencing there Charles and Ray Ames. Um, contemporary uh, design mixed with classical styles. Um, and 
what was the response? What, what, how did the market respond to that? I mean, you're, that's what you're describing there is someone who's first to spot a connection between two seemingly very different art worlds. And yet somehow it seemed to work. But what was the, how did the market respond? Uh, the other thing that I should have mentioned to you in, the, in, the, in this question is that uh, with Alain Machi, they had set up a business which was called CARL, C-A-R-L, which was uh, in the same location, but which was selling uh, design by uh, contemporary designer, like people like David, David X and others. And um, so, I mean, it, but it was something like, I mean, it, it was uh, integrated uh, in the uh, interior design business in the in the business of uh, of the business of my father really which was antique dealer it was rather separate i mean it was two different type of businesses it's so interesting though to see that that was that crossover was spotted so early on because it's commonplace now that you know many galleries and dealers have long standing relationships with interior decorators and designers and they kind of work harmoniously with one another for obvious reasons but to see that as early as the 60s is quite and is quite interesting let's go back to your involvement now i mean you joined the gallery in 1975 and two years later you were actually <laughs> you were tasked with opening your first gallery overseas in new york now this sounds like a lot for a 24 year old to manage which i imagine was probably around your age at the time how on earth did you handle opening a gallery in new york uh, I mean, it was a big challenge. Uh, in fact, I moved to New York the 23rd of August, 1976. Okay. And uh, my father, I mean, uh, we had bought a house and uh, we, um, and we want, he wanted to open a gallery and I was up for the challenge. So I moved uh, to New York, but at the time I thought I was going to move for one year or something like this or two years. And I stayed uh, 17. But um, it was challenging, and uh, somehow I must say that I got really, really lucky because uh, in the house on the, which we where, I, where I'm talking to you from now on 67th Street, uh, we did renovate the entire place. We did get the entire place and redo it, except we left uh, some of the nice interior because it was the house of Marcel Rochas uh, before the war. And so it has, it has still a beautiful uh, staircase uh, with mirrors like the uh, like the Chanel uh, mirror staircase. Uh, but I mean, I did uh, entire renovation, not speaking very well English, worse than now. And uh, I got lucky because uh, I did find uh, a very good uh, general contractor, and I could have been uh, ripped apart by a uh, crook and I did find a nice guy so everything went well and uh, we were ready for the opening which was on the 15th of November 1977 which was a grand opening of 100 people at the uh, uh, service culturel of the French Embassy with uh, Hélène Rochas uh, and uh, Edmond Rothschild being our godparents. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge. Hmm. But what you described there, which is quite uh, quite important, I think, was you'd gone there initially thinking you'd be there for two years and you were there for 17. So you basically built an entire life in New York, not being able to speak English very well. Yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> thrown in at the deep end. <laughs> What's um, what's um, I think important again outside your involvement with the family business has been your uh, involvement in various in, uh, various initiatives that I guess you could say support the development and growth of the fine art world in general. I mean, you've been involved in the creation of many art fairs like the Salon du Dessin, uh, Paris Tableau, and Fine Art Paris. Um, you've also held numerous executive executive positions in many art, or art organizations like the National Antique and Art Dealers Association of America. And in 1988, you even founded something called the Committee Colbert in the U.S. So tell us, what is the Committee Colbert and what's your connection to it? Uh, the Committee Colbert is an association of, uh, maybe now it has evolved because we are not in it anymore. Uh, but at the time, it was an association of 70 luxury brand uh, French who were creators and we were only a member of Colbert 
because of our uh, interior design work. There are no antique dealers in the Comité Colbert. So Comité Colbert represents the, uh, I mean, the crème de la crème of luxury goods in France, like Hermès, like Dior, like Guerlain, uh, like uh, Christophe, like Puyforca, like places like this. And uh, I got involved by, uh, because we, we were organizing an exhibition in Tokyo uh, and uh, I know that I'm already going to your next questions, but I was organizing an exhibition, we were organizing an exhibition in Tokyo in 1982 and uh, my father didn't want to go there, so he sent me and there I met the uh, director of Colbert and I told him, you know, I live in the US, so if you ever do something in the US, uh, contact me. And in 1987, they did contact me uh, because they were doing an exhibition for the bicentennial of the French Revolution, um, which was 1789, if you remember. So it was uh, 1989. So we had to prepare that exhibition and it was not very easy because the relationship between the members of Colbert and the Cooper Hewitt Museum was not very, very good. And so I'm the one who managed all that. And at the same time, as it did work, they did ask me to uh, create a Comité Colbert, a kind of subsidiary, a kind of branch of the Comité Colbert of, uh, in the United States. And I was in charge of a, of a commission which was called Commission Culturelle Internationale. So I was in charge of all the cultural events. And I was going to meetings where instead of speaking with the head, I was speaking with the guy who was in charge of the marketing at, uh, at Dior, who was there since six months and was going to leave in one year. And it was not the same. You know, they did not have the, the same, um, I mean, they were not putting their, I mean, it's, it's a little bit uh, outrageous what I'm going to say, but they were, not, they were not putting their guts on the plate. When you were talking with, uh, where you were talking with Jean-Louis Dumas Hermès, uh, or where you, you were talking, uh, I never talked with Christian Dior, but when you were talking with uh, the, the, the head of those companies, I mean, they had so much their job at heart. Uh, it was not just a matter of balance sheet. Uh, and it's, uh, I mean, that's what makes a difference, I think. Uh, but I w what I want to say also uh, about... Um, my my life in New York at that time is that the gallery in Paris was the sister gallery, really the sister gallery image of the gallery, uh, the gallery in New York, sorry, was the sister image of the gallery in Paris, dealing in 18th century French furniture, some 18th century paintings. And I did realize that uh, American clients did not want to buy their French furniture in uh, in New York, and they wanted to buy it in Paris. So very quickly I changed the format of the house and got interested into 19th century decorative art. So uh, basically, I mean, the, I've, I've been involved in a, yes, in a lot of things. And uh, the, the, the gallery in New York has changed a lot from what it was originally. And to speak about my uh, involvement in this different uh, uh, initiative, I would say that there's a side of me which is like uh, 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 believing in association, believing in, in working with people, organizing things. And that's why I was really uh, probably even better in organizing Salon du Dessin, uh, Fine Art Paris, and the Syndicat des Antiquaires than even doing my business. Mm. Is, that how you, is that how you would say your, the, 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 the gallery operates now? With, with with a real with a heart how, is that a big factor for you what is what is rather i mean in our gallery we've been obliged uh, to focus a little bit all right i mean we don't uh, i mean i don't buy uh, burn jones uh, where in fact i could have told you that in 1974 i wanted to buy uh, uh, Pre-Raphaelite painting, and my father said I was a, that I was a total ass, and he didn't want me to do it. So the limitation of the man, also. But uh, you 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 have to focus a little bit. Uh, but in this focus, I mean, I think that, uh, and, and I, it's it's and it's probably a mistake. Eh? Uh, we buy what we like, and only what we like. We don't buy because we think that it's going to sell. 
uh, nowadays uh, we are more obliged to uh, not buy what we think is not going to sell. For example, I mean, a French 18th century portrait, even if it's fantastically painted by a good painter, uh, if the artist is not Boucher or Largillière, I mean, you don't buy it because nobody buys a portrait. So that's what enters in consideration. But otherwise, we really buy what we like. Mm. It's very, 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 very interesting. Of course, we've covered quite a lot of ground there. The Committee Colbert, I think, is worth pointing out, is it was actually founded by Jean-Jacques Galin. Um, I mean, uh, incredible, absolutely incredible that you were involved with that. Um, now, to talk about what you've just discussed there, the uh, I'd, I'd like to just go back to this, actually. The transition that you'd... I mean, you talk about the, the businesses existing as, as, as two separate elements, almost a sister gallery in New York and the boutique in Paris, and the boutique in Paris dealing in 18th century furniture and decorative arts. But you, of course, had spotted and, and were responding to a change in the market that American clients didn't want to buy French furniture in America. They wanted to buy it in Paris. So you... Um, you begin to transform and create that almost separate um, uh, arm of the business where you're dealing in, in pictures and paintings. How did you how did you handle and develop that? Uh, how and, and you know what was the family's response to you saying? I think we should look at this in a different way. Uh, so the uh, the uh, the move towards uh, painting and uh, and drawing is uh, something which uh, somehow was initiated by by my brother who died two years ago but who was working with us in the, in the gallery and uh, who had worked at the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, I mean, he was very interested into, into paintings. So uh, basically he, um, he started a little department of paintings and drawings in Paris uh, early in the 70s, uh, at the time where I moved to New York. And um, I saw that uh, it was uh, somehow the the future of our uh, of our uh, of our company when after doing all those exhibitions of 19th century uh, European decorative art in New York I came back to Paris in 1993 uh, to uh, be uh, assigned my father to run the business uh, I did move very much the company into that direction. I mean, it is uh, something which is rather common in our business. Uh, you would uh, take, I mean, I don't want to compare myself to them, but you would take people like Wildenstein. I mean, the same, Wildenstein started with furniture and moved on to paintings. I mean, painting somehow uh, is easier, not uh, not to, uh, not as a, as a knowledge or, but it's, I mean, it's, uh, it weights less, it takes less space. And uh, and I I did like very much. I mean, I was very uh, I was very uh, much uh, pushing the gallery towards that uh, um, towards that um, uh, that transition. In addition to that, I want to add that uh, you cannot do a business uh, without people. And uh, the collaborators that I, that we had in Paris. And in New York with Alan Source, who was working with me since 1982, uh, was, uh, I mean, Alan Source was, uh, um, had been also working at the Metropolitan Museum, had been working at Wildenstein. And uh, yeah, I took him uh, with me in New York, evidently, to develop this uh, old master uh, department. So, I mean, it's since the uh, early 80s, and uh, especially when I moved back to Paris, uh, wanted very much the um, old master painting and drawings to be the major activity in the gallery. Hmm. I would just want to actually just rewind a little bit because we touched on um, Japan a little while ago. You were mentioning Japan and going out to, to Asia. And I think the reason why I'd like to return to that is because you can begin to see a pattern here um, and that is really your, your family business, both yourself, your brother and your father. You're doing things as a series of firsts, 
or very, very early. You're quite early into either a market. You're quick to respond. You're quick to see things. And I think that's very, very interesting. And I'd be very curious, you going back now to the 80s, how did Asia respond to what you were doing and what you were dealing in that time? And what did you learn from that experience? Uh, I, I learned quite a lot, uh, but I learned that Asia, especially, I learned that Asia was very difficult and a totally different market. But going to uh, Asia, uh, I met somebody who is now a rather important contemporary uh, gallery uh, in Hong Kong and in Singapore uh, called Pearl Lam. And uh, with Pearl Lam, with whom I became a friend, I made two exhibitions in Hong Kong in the, in the early 90s. Uh, so I made an exhibition uh, with uh, Madame Rena Dumas, who was uh, showing a collection of, uh, of furniture design. And I was uh, showing 18th century paintings. And I made another exhibition with Pearl Lam of decorative art from the 18th century to the to the to the modern day, so uh, so that was our first encounter with Asia. Since that, I've tried many times, and I do realize that uh, I mean I can have Asian clients, but it is uh, almost impossible uh, for a gallery of our size, which is not a huge gallery, I mean to uh, develop uh, oneself in the in the Eastern market. When you were saying, if I may go back to something else, when you were saying that I was, uh, that we were the premier in doing this or in doing that, I just want to mention something which uh, you don't have in, in your questionnaire, but which uh, uh, I have very much at, at art, is that I was the first investor. So I was the creator of Artnet. I was the first guy to put some money believing that uh, the internet would one day revolutionize our business. And uh, I mean, I was very much criticized by my colleagues uh, because of that. But it's, uh, I mean, something I'm really proud of it, except that uh, like Asia, I did it, I did Asia something probably 22, 20 years too early. Uh, Artnet, I was in Artnet, uh, the chairman of Artnet, 22 years, 20 years too early also. And uh, I think that timing is very, very important in life. But I'm very proud of having done all those things. It, I, I, we, it, during our research, you've, you, I, I've kind of just um, stuck for words. I had no idea you were involved in Artnet. Artnet is, of course, you know, the backbone of the industry in many respects now. Um, but wow, to have seen online so early. Timing, as you say, is, 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 is so important. What was your attraction to, to Artnet? Was that motivated purely on the basis that you could see online as the medium was, was the future of the industry? At the time, we, we were creating a database of result at auction. And I did believe that information and transparency of the art business was something which uh, would prevail. But uh, at the time uh, when I created Artnet, it was in 1988, and uh, there was no internet. So when we were selling to our clients, when we were selling to our clients the database, we were selling also, which means the software, we were also selling to them the hardware. So that's why it did cost us enormous amount of money. And that's why I got very, very quickly uh, dissolved by uh, having less and less capital. But I remember a very amazing story where we went to London uh, to try to get on board because we needed money, try to get on board Sotheby's, try to get on board Christie's. And in 1989, they, the both companies said, internet, never, never. So our idea was to create this database and then afterwards to create auctions online. Uh, th that was in 1990. And, uh, but that happened much, much later and I was not involved anymore. That happened much, much later with Artnet. That's so interesting. A series of firsts, absolutely. Um, let's just return to kind of the, 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 the family timeline, the history of the business almost. Uh, you know, cause a space in London followed in 1985. Um, and the question there, I suppose, in, uh, that springs to mind is, by this point, with the space in London, you're now managing three businesses, basically, in three different locations, Paris, New York, and London. And I'd be just curious, you know, how... 
how are you managing a, a business with an international footprint? Because you've already touched on something, of course. Being 1985, this is before the internet, it's before email. How are you managing the correspondence between all those different businesses? Yeah, and I did hide something to you again. Uh, <laughs> we created in 1982, uh, we opened in 1982 a gallery in Los Angeles. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, in Melrose Place, um, with a decorator who now is dead, whose name was Kalef Alaton. And uh, how do you handle that? You only handle that uh, uh, if you have uh, good people working for you. I mean, uh, when I was in uh, New York, I was uh, I was doing New York. My father was in Paris. Uh, we had somebody very good in London, and uh, I did find somebody very good to to to, to run Los Angeles. It was rather small, and uh, then I moved to Paris and I left Alan Souls in charge of New York. I mean, all that is a question of uh, of people, and considering the fact also that uh, Paris has always been the main uh, center and the main, uh, I mean, the mother gallery or the father gallery, whatever you want to call it, uh, that for many reasons it's because most of in our inventor is there, and also because uh, uh, Europe is a place where you were finding and still are finding. Uh, most of the object of our in our business, so um, people make you help you uh, run an international business. Now, I would like to just turn our attention to the works in which you deal, um, and of course, we're talking more specifically now about paintings and pictures and sculptures. Um, and you've actually placed many, many, many important works in major institutions internationally over the years. And in 2003, after a year of negotiations, you actually sold Titian's portrait of Alfonso d'Avalon in armour to the Getty. So help us understand what made that work significant. Uh, probably, I mean, uh, because uh, it was the biggest deal I made in my career. And second, because it was probably uh, the most interesting in terms of uh, painting and negotiation. What happened is that in 19... Uh, 91, uh, the French family called the Ganet uh, was selling that painting by Titian, and there was provision in French laws which permitted the French government to let a third party buy it and to have it deposited at the Louvre. So the painting was deposited at the Louvre, and the contract was that for 12 years, the Louvre could buy it at the original selling price plus the interest. But after 12 years, that the painting would be free. And uh, what happened is that a year before, so I mean 2002, uh, uh, Alan Souls, who uh, had good connection at the Getty Museum, uh, knew that the Getty uh, was going to be interested in that painting. And he knew also that I was very friendly with, at the time, the CEO of AXA, whose name is Henri de Castro, who was Henri, he was the CEO at the time. And um, so he pushed me to go to see Henri de Castro, and I did get a mandate uh, from AXA to sell that painting. And uh, then after, I mean, it, uh, things were rather easy, except that uh, we went through a lot of peripacy, which was uh, having a 200-page contract signed, between uh, me, AXA, and, uh, and the Getty, which I was not used to before, uh, going to AXA to have the, the, the painting uh, checked by the, uh, the curator and the restorer, uh, put into a special box with people from the Getty there, and the same moment before taking the box, having Henri Cass go to the next room and make the, the, the immediate transfer of funds from France to the US and uh, and so on and so on. And uh, then after, well, the uh, the French were not too happy, even though they had signed that agreement with AXA, they were not too happy to see the painting leave. So that was a few other problems, but uh, everything got solved. And uh, I, yeah, it was, the, 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 it is still at this day, the biggest deal I've, I've made and the most interesting one. 
Yeah, I'd like to just sort of dive a little bit more into that, actually. I mean, if you think about your, and this is going to look, this might look like a stupid question, but if you think about your experience in, in, in your education, your formal education of the business side, your on the job experience running the gallery in New York, did that prepare you for, for, for handling and negotiating a deal of that size? Or was this, I mean, how do you prepare for something like this? Is this? Are you literally drawing on skills that you've acquired by that point to know exactly how to navigate those waters? Or is uh, uh, to help us understand how you handled something like that, a negotiation of that size? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it was not that that complicated, but I mean, uh, yeah, the past, I mean, experience is a huge help. I mean, experience uh, cannot be replaced by anything else, even by, even, uh, I mean, going to school doesn't replace experience. So, I mean, the experience of uh, handling uh, a company like AXA, uh, the experience of handling a museum like the Getty, the experience of uh, uh, helping the negotiation um, between the lawyer of the Getty and the lawyer of AXA, uh, which uh, somehow reminded me of uh, my experience at Colbert, where I was uh, basically the interface between uh, the members of Colbert and the, the museum world of the Cooper Hewitt, and, uh, and then handling uh, the French government and the aftermath of the sale. Yes, all that uh, is uh, probably uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the, the experience that did help me to do that. Very interesting. Let's talk more broadly now about um, some of the works you deal in um, with respect to the recent living artists. I mean, you're actually dealing works by uh, Mario Dillitz, and it's it seems to work, but it's it's in stark contrast in terms of its execution and its style and its visual language to Titian's portrait, for example. So, what drew you to 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 work like that? What draws you to work such as that? Uh, what drove me to uh, I mean, it, it it's um, probably my sense of diversity and my and my curiosity. Uh, I thought, uh, like uh, 20 years ago, that I could become easily uh, a modern painting dealer because I could see that uh, French furniture were going down uh, the drain a little by little by little. And uh, but I realized that uh, uh, I did not know enough, and that you don't uh, become um, a modern art dealer from one day to the other. And at the same time. I don't uh, very much uh, appreciate, uh, I mean, I don't appreciate it. It's, I don't think it really works to, I mean, to have uh, contemporary paintings with uh, French 18th century furniture, except if they really mix and uh, they are of great quality. But to go back to why I did that, I did that uh, because uh, I wanted to, to to put a little um, sort of contemporary activity in our uh, in our old master paintings, and I only did it uh, because I did like the artist. I did not. I mean, I, we, we've been we've been doing three exhibitions here of a Russian artist who uh, called Victor Kulbak, who does um, uh, watercolor and silver point drawings like Leonardo da Vinci was doing, but it's modern drawings uh, and a living artist. Uh, Mario Dilitz, uh, who is an Austrian sculptor living um, alone in the mountain of Austria, is doing those, uh, those sculptures. And one day I was, uh, I was walking at Masterpiece uh, in front of the, the booth of, uh, of Sladmore Gallery. And I said, I love what this guy is doing. And I went to see the people of Sadmore Gallery, and I told them, um, is, has he ever done an exhibition in the U.S.? And they said, no. So I said, I would really like to make an exhibition. So, but all those things, except for for Kulbach, which uh, we've done several times, are somehow a bit of one-shot things, which uh, uh, I feel don't denaturate or work as a... Uh, all master dealer, but I cannot say that it is a branch that I have developed. I mean, it's more like uh, uh, having fun in something that I believe in. Mm. 
How would you describe your, your line of taste, your personal line of taste? Uh, I am very, very eclectic. Uh, my main collection is um, drawings, uh, minerals uh, coming from the earth, minerals, and uh, contemporary Italian glass. So, I mean, you, um, you see, it's, uh, I mean, the whole spectrum. Uh, I forgot to tell you another thing, which is that in 1975, well, the first year I worked with my father before coming to New York, I did not want to work into uh, uh, the, uh, the French furniture business directly. So I had a friend who was uh, a dealer of uh, a Greek and Roman sculpture. And so I started a little department of Greek and Roman sculpture in the gallery in Paris. And I went to Beirut in 1975 just before the war with the Palestinians and, uh, and, and, and bought antiquities. Like in 1974, even before working with my father, I made an exhibition in his gallery of uh, American quilts, okay? American quilts of the 19th century. And I think it's one of the best exhibitions ever made on American quilts. I had found a, I had found a fabulous collection and I did exhibit it. So yes, I am very, very, uh, uh, I mean, across the board. Again, this is probably quite a broad question, but what, what's your prediction for what the future of the industry is going to look like? What trends do you see? You talk about this change in attitude to buying art. I, uh, it's a question that I could have answered very easily 10 years ago, and uh, which, uh, which was already, I mean, uh, I, I was thinking that, uh, uh, or even five years ago, I was thinking that the, the art business will, will evolve in, a, I mean, one of our biggest competitors has been the auction houses. Not only, uh, not only the, the auction itself, but now the auction uh, houses uh, have the right to do a private sale. So the auction houses are dealers with a much bigger uh, uh, powerhouse. Uh, and uh, but what I was always uh, and I still think the same: our business will survive uh, when you're going to be very specialized and when you are going to be able to um, uh, to provide to your clients a certain knowledge, a certain confidence, a certain secrecy. But more than secrecy, secrecy is not the most important thing. The most important thing is your knowledge and the confidence that you're going to uh, bring to your clients. And that will evolve. And what I was saying five years ago, and which I still believe is the case, even if I'm a bit less sure, in that you will have two types of dealers. You will have the, the dealers who is almost like a decorator who just sells stuff to, uh, to furnish a house or to furnish walls or whatever, and you will have the dealers who is very much uh, in a niche, who is very much uh, specialized uh, in, a, in, in one area. Mm, yeah, it's interesting. Um, to what do you attribute your success today, your personal success? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, my success is, uh, I mean, you, you're talking about my success in business or my success in life? Both. My success in life is the uh, is the fact that I've done a lot of things which were which are been so enriching and uh, and uh, so great that uh, so I had a very full life in very different categories as we as we saw you and I uh, together. Uh, the success uh, in the business is that we are probably one of the uh, last uh, in old master uh, painting. Uh, to do, uh, to have a gallery in London, a gallery of Paris, a gallery in New York, and still be successful and still working at it uh, with confidence. Mm -hmm. Ariane Dandoy, I'm hope, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly, a Parisian dealer in 19th century decorative arts and a family friend for 45 years, recalled your father sharing with her how business had doubled after having moved the gallery, after which she promptly moved across the street from your father in Paris. So... What do you think that tells us about your father's love for the business of dealing, which is very similar to your own? 
Uh, yes, uh, my, my father was extremely uh, bright and a, and, a, and, a, and a real entrepreneur. You know, he was not just an, uh, an art dealer. He was an entrepreneur. And that's uh, where I explained to you what his war was and what he did before the war. And he probably would have been uh, even more successful if he had done a business uh, which you can reproduce, you know, I mean, uh, uh, which and you can grow uh, immensely. Uh, when he moved, uh, we, we, we were in the 1970s, we were near the Trocadero, which means that we were ex exempted from, uh, from where the art business was in Paris, or where, not the art business at the time, the traffic of people. So my father wanted absolutely to move Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and uh, where there was a lot of traffic of people because there was a lot of hotels, restaurants, and etc. And he was probably the first one to move back there. But uh, if I do remember well, this area for Bourg Saint Honoré, uh, uh, Rue de la Boissie, which is just behind, I mean, the eighth district was the main uh, dealer's area at the end of the 19th century. Um, that's where the Wildenstein were, that's where uh, Durand Ruel was, etc., etc. So, my, so just, to, just to say that my father always had visions and uh, wanted to uh, and, and, and wanted to follow them. I don't know what would be his vision uh, today, but um, I mean, that's it. What visions do you en 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 entertain, you personally? What visions do you operate with? Do you operate with a, with a vision in mind? Yes, I I operate with that vision that uh, uh, and uh, that one should be very specialized into a field, and uh, but it's very difficult. I mean, it it, uh, it I mean the other thing with in our business, which is uh, which also has changed and which I did forget to mention before, is that it is a very capital incentive business. Uh, which was much less before. Uh, now to be, uh, as I said, to be uh, really very focused on uh, on one specialty and to be the best in it, you need enormous amount of capital because uh, contrary to an auction houses, and again, here I make uh, the comparison, uh, contrary to the auction houses, we have to invest in the capital and uh, and it may not turn around as fast as we would like to. So, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what is going to be the future of our business, but I would think that that's going to that's going to be it. That's going to be that way. That's very interesting talking about um, investing in something on the in the, with the belief and the vision that it will materialize in the future. So again, this is um, an ability to predict. Or, or, or place your bets on something happening in the future, commercially speaking. Um, how important do you think risk is in business, being able to take risks? Uh, I think it's very important. But I mean, what, 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 what I was saying about capital in, uh, incentive, uh, capital uh, need, uh, it was not really in, in, a, in a, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, we should, I mean, it, it is part of our business also to buy things that are under-evaluated because they are not in fashion. Because even in the old master world, you have fashion. Like I have a colleague called Maurizio Caneso, who in, the, who in the, the last 30 years has bought a lot of 17th century Baroque uh, painting, which we are totally undervalued, and he has promoted them. So uh, there is this part. Um, but the, I mean, the, the other part is, is really the risk that you're taking is not to buy something that people don't know and that, that you have to make them understand because now it has almost everything has been, not everything, but I mean, almost everything has been, has, has been light or not light. But what the risk that you take is that you believe that what you have in your hand is a painting by Mr. X, where basically when it's sold to you, it's sold as, as nothing. And that's, that's a risk because you're investing money in something 
which uh, can uh, a year later, two years later, still be worth nothing, or one day can be worth something if you discover what exactly the painting is. Hmm. I think um, if we reflect for a moment on the the history of the family business, uh, the three locations, the I guess the illustrious history of your connection to the fine art world, the fact the culture of fine art historically since you know the uh, the, the mid and early twentieth century, um, to where we are today with you as the president. What do you think your father would have to say about what you and your team have achieved today? I think that he would have said that I uh, I was not adventurous enough. I think that you know I mean his his idea of I mean because it was he, he had to do it because he had absolutely no money and uh, and he had even no money to buy his uh, his antiques in 1946 no 47 so his idea of doing interior design and and make some money like this was a great idea and for 20 30 or 40 years it was basically the uh, it was a not oh, I mean it's not very elegant to say it like this but it was our cash machine it was what did allow us to buy uh, paintings at an expensive uh, price and uh, what he would say now to me, I think, is uh, invent something else, Hervé. Uh, do, do I mean, yeah, I would. I'm absolutely sure that's what he would say. Mm. With the benefit of experience, if you could go back and give yourself advice when you were 24, 25, uh, getting involved in the family business, what would it be? Uh, two things. I mean, uh, now it. You, be involved in the family business uh, as I was at the time believing uh, with the example of my brother and uh, and what I started there, believing more in paintings and uh, in old master and drawings. My big regret is uh, not to have done more uh, in-depth studies. I mean, the studies that I have done um, I've done a, uh, a Bachelor of Art, a Master that I've never finished, which in fact had nothing to do with what I'm doing. It was a Master about the theory of color between Baudelaire and Delaunay. So it had nothing to do with old Master. And um, my study of management, all that are very good and broad studies. But I think I would have, li I would have loved and would have needed uh, to be better in my business uh, which I do compensate by having people better than I am in certain fields. I would have liked to have done more academical studies in the in the world of all masters. What advice would you give someone starting out dealing in works of art now? Oh, that's a not, that's a totally different story. I mean, I've I've I'm, I've been asked this question by young people very often, and my uh, in my first. An immediate answer is love. I mean, it has to be a passion. If it's not a passion, don't even go into it. Uh, and then after, I say to them, it is not easy and it's not difficult. Uh, it's not easy and it is difficult. I mean, you have. I mean, and and you have to. I mean, and, and you have a lot of different words. I mean, you cannot say that you have an art world. I mean, you have a lot of different words. I mean, you have the world of of curators. You have the world of uh, uh, of scholars, you have the world of dealers, you have the world of auctioneers, and even inside the, the world of dealers, you cannot say that you have one art market because the art market of uh, antiquities and the art market of uh, um, contemporary art and the art market of old masters are totally different and they work differently. So I would tell them uh, you got to know what you want to do because you're not sure that you're going to be uh, really and you're not gonna make a fortune but if you love it that's the main thing you exhausted me <laughs> you know that <laughs> thank you for listening you can follow and subscribe to the bigger picture wherever you get your podcasts to learn more about this episode or to reach out to us directly please visit arcata.com <laughs>